Welcome to Cardinal O'Hara High School's Career Day keynote interview. I'm Haley Vigani. And I'm Katie Tuberosa. Today, we are excited to welcome back O'Hara's alum and actor, P. Pustiglione, who will be discussing his upcoming movie, Last Call. And he is joined by Last Call's executive producer and co-writer, Greg Lingo, and Paolo Pilati, who co-wrote and directed the movie. Thank you for joining us today and welcome. We are excited to find out more about the movie and to ask you some questions about careers in the entertainment industry. We wanted to start off by asking you about Last Call. Can you tell us more about it? Yes, I'd love to. Good. You want me to start? Sure. Okay. Um, so Last Call is about um, a community much like Delaware County uh, or any town USA. Actually, there are these characters that exist in this movie are characters that exist in almost any town anywhere in the world. Um, but we thought, what a great way to tell a story about the characters in Delaware County. And it's about a guy who uh, is having some troubles. He goes back to the neighborhood to see if he can solve some problems and, uh, and clean up, I guess, the family bar, we'll say. Yeah. You want to take over from here? Yeah, so um, Paolo and I wrote this story together really... Um, having grown up in Delaware County, and Palo was just over the line in Overbrook, we had a lot of similar stories and people that we kind of came across over the course of our lives and we, that were funny and, and sometimes pathetically funny, but funny nonetheless. And we wanted to, we wanted to string together a, a, a comedy and a story and it took us some time to get to, to kind of formulate it into a story, but we were really fortunate when we got to the point of, I guess it was really spring of 2019 when we started putting the cast to our story. And uh, we, we got a tremendous cast. It was important to me that locally we, we got as many local actors as we could. So I actually reached out to my, I guess it's cousin-in-law who's a graduate of, of O'Hare in 1989 and asked her if she could introduce me to Pete because I knew Pete had done some, some acting. And, and I think the two of you guys had worked together before that. Yeah, we have a few a few moves back on a project. On a project, yeah, yeah. horror film. The world is small. Especially it's a small world. world, especially around here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just to piggyback on what Greg said, I I get the phone call from Greg. He said, you know, mutual contact. Are you interested? And you know, being an actor, I'm like, yeah, let me read it. And, uh, and of course, I'm asking for like, oh, I love this part. Yeah. He's like, yeah, Jeremy Piven's going to play that part. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, how about this one? He's like, why don't you concentrate on the bartender? I was like, great, love to. Yeah, especially when you have an opportunity to work, it's it's hard enough to get into these movies. I've been doing this for almost 20 years, right? So it's hard enough to get in, and you go up against 60. 60 people sometimes just for like a five line part so it's hard enough to get in so when an executive producer calls you and says just do this yeah sure no problem and then the opportunity to work with those big names and and just to work with folks that you know are in the neighborhood because i like to build this community up and not have to worry about always going west for hollywood if that makes any sense to you guys like uh i think that can exist here i've always thought that you know, I thought it was a necessary evil to go there, but if we can create that here, why not? There's a lot of talented folks right here in Delaware County. It, uh, I think the, the infancy of it was really me sitting down with literally some of my grade school friends and just jotting down stories. We thought it would be funny to just chronicle all of the different things that we thought were ridiculous that happened to us. I remember going to college and talking to some of my new college friends about my brothers, my neighborhood, my parents, uh, my my buddy's parents and they were kind of like this is this could be a movie this is crazy what you're talking about these these people they're just so unique rich funny and and unique wouldn't you say yeah for sure um, typically I write I write alone and so this project was different in the sense that Greg had already written a first draft of the script and um, the very first time we met the very first time we met we met at um, at Barnaby's in Havertown, I think it is, right? Anyway, um, Greg had said over lunch, you know, this, is, uh, this feels like it needs to be a comedy with a heart. And that's something I always remembered as we were doing various drafts, as you do, and, and going through many incarnations of the script. It's something that always stuck with me, but, but the, whether or not we had, and you tend to have differences of, of what might be funny or what might work in a story or whatever, 
Um, I think this this idea that, you know, like Greg had mentioned, I'm from Overbrook and he's from Upper Darby and we're literally separated by Cobbs Creek. And so I knew uh, we may have had a different language at times to say the same thing, but I knew I knew the story that that ultimately he wanted to tell and that I thought was that I could tell from a directorial standpoint, um, because I knew the I knew the characters intimately because I had grown up, you know. I am of that. We are of that world, you know. So, and you know, it's one of the things they teach you. Is the first thing they teach you is write what you know. Um, and I knew that world, so we could we could go. Why part of the in a way it made it harder because we had so many stories. There were so many, you know, so many potential characters, and this was an ensemble. And and so, uh, but it always I think more than anything, um, the joy of it was like kind of rehashing a lot of those things and, and thinking about like. Yeah, this guy was was a bit of a, maybe a bit of a lunatic, but he had certain qualities you just don't find in the day to day world that are really um, noble in a lot of ways, you know. And and so, anyway, it was a, yeah, it was a fun process. It was it was a little bit of uh, going back in, into childhood and and you know also looking forward because I do think it's very contemporary too. Uh, now with um, there's a an element of uh, gentrification going on in the story, and so with. You know, I think that's a big issue around the country. So, yeah, I'm excited for uh, excited for it to come out. <laughs> Why was the movie originally called Crabs in a Bucket? <laughs> so the idea the idea of Crabs in a Bucket is that literally, if you throw a bunch of them in a bucket, and when one of them almost crawls out, one of its buddies that's in the bucket will still kind of pull it back down. And we had the, our main character, Jeremy Piven's character, Mick, in the movie had gotten out of the bucket, but his friends were kind of trying to bring him back in. Um, I think ultimately our distributor IFC Films was right that that's, it's, it's a little bit of a confusing name. You know, is it a National Geographic? Is it a commie? So for them, they, you know, they kind of taught us, I think, you really got to get closer to two words and it has to be a little more clear of what the intent is so that if an audience, whether it's a foreign audience or somebody in the Midwest, they could kind of understand it quickly uh, without having a lot of explanation. How is it shooting a movie about Delco but filming in New Jersey? I'll give that one to you. Uh, again, there are a lot of towns that exist anywhere, whether it's Jersey, whether it's Pittsburgh, whether it's, there are towns that exist that are similar to this one. So. Um, you know, my day was in Bayonne. We shot in Bayonne at a bar that <laughs> almost looked like any bar that you would walk into here. The neighborhood looked just the same. So that was an easy transition for not just myself, but for everyone who was there that day. And there were a lot of people, you know, on set that day. Um, and, uh, and then it doesn't really matter location-wise once all those people get together, because then the personalities kind of take over the location. And it's like their home. That's their home. They're just going to make it that way because that's the way a lot of these folks are. So, um, you know, I, I'm not uh, far into being behind a bar. I've served some drinks before, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I've done that job. But uh, what was foreign was I had to play an Irish bartender. And my name is Pete Postiglione. And <laughs> can you imagine the dichotomy there? So um, the irony was I played this Irish bartender, which, but I guess I did a good job. Yeah, man. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think they would have, uh, Paolo would have said early on, no, let's lose the accent. Let's do something else. But um, it worked, no, especially it worked. for it this type of out. film. Absolutely it just worked, worked. Greg, since the movie is based on growing up in Upper Darby, what was challenging about bringing this script to life? I, I think the, the biggest challenge is that the story isn't really any specific story. It's not my story. It's not any story of one of the actors. It's really more themes. And, and taking this collection of stories and then working them into a theme that is translatable whatever city you're in or whatever town you're in throughout the United States. I think that was, that was probably the biggest challenge. And really, Paolo helped with taking the script that we had that was pretty rough and turning it into a traditional three-act script and working a love interest into the story. And um, it was really neat to see ideas come to life and then you know, I think they say that this, the script you write is different than what gets shot, and then ultimately what gets edited is a little bit different, and I think each step along the way we made it a better film.
Uh, Paolo, as a director, what advice do you have for young adults as it relates to what directors look for in an actor? Um, I, I think of whether or not they listen. I think that's the biggest thing for me. I, I, I happen to love actors. Uh, I love them and I fall in love with them. Um, and so, uh, you know, for me, I, I, I take, Pete and I talked about this because he, does, he d does some classes and stuff. And I've taken improv for and classes to know, I think too many filmmakers, too many directors don't, um, they get so caught up, there's so much going on and it's very technical and, and, and all this time setting up lights and then it's hurry up and, and at a take and we gotta move on to the next scene. Um, I, you know, I will give actors, I'll get my take and I will always give actors another take, always, always, I don't, you know, and, and I'll, I'll make time up somewhere else in the day, but I respect them enough to, they know if they've gotten it or if they want to try something a different way. And, and building that trust up is really important. But, but I think for as far as actors, I think listening, you know, getting out of their own head, listening to like their other, um, you know, their, their, if they're playing a scene with someone else, just listening and kind of that back and forth, that volley for me is the most important. Um, because I think, you know, actors, you know, just like everyone else, we tense up. And then if things feel a little rigid, or if you maybe if you've never been on set, for example, with Bruce Dern, there might be a tendency to be a little bit uh, I don't know, starstruck, but but just you know not in out of character, and that's what that's what you don't want. You don't want to see as director. So, you know, just reminding them that it's okay to you know I'm not going to let them fall, because so, you're asking them to be you're asking an actor to be very uh, private in a public space and that's not easy to do and I think a lot of filmmakers lose sight of that because there's all this other stuff going on and then I gotta say to Jeremy you just found out that something really bad happened to your family and you've been not you know you've been really close to that like it's not an easy place for people to get it's easy for actors but it's not easy for the the, the layman to get to that emotional state so understand that they could be very very raw um, and just kind of give them their space, you know, but, but ultimately listen. Like for young actors, and you would, you would probably be able to speak to that better than me, but I would say to listen. Not worry about like what that next line is. That's great. Actually, 100%. Listening is a huge thing. Um, may I? So uh, I, I own an acting studio in Swarthmore, and um, that's one of the things that we constantly talk about. Like everybody is so worried about what they're going to say, what they're going to say, what they're going to say, that they're not listening to what the other person says. It happens all the time and at the highest levels, the highest levels. So um, if you're an active listener, you're going to be a better actor, period. That's what's great about improv in general, both in yeah. class form, but also on the day, on set, because um, it, it forces you to listen. You know, and, and I had said to, to almost every single actor, but certainly the ones who, uh, who had a tendency to, to improv, if as long, I don't care about that line so much as the intent of that line. Because mm -hmm. it's usually, we all speak in subtext anyway in normal life. We don't ever usually say what we mean as directly as it's sometimes written on the page in an unnatural way. Um, but so yeah, I think um, as long as you know what, where you want to get to, let's go. But it, but if it forces, and you know, as a director, there's all kinds of tricks. But you know, you could tell one actor to do something to another actor, or not let them do something that forces them to listen, which gets them out of their head. If you feel like an actor is not get not, you know, one actor is not getting all the way there, or is struggling, or just feels a little false. That moment you know? is so real too. Yeah, especially so, if you do that. And you know, again, I was. I mean, I can't. I can't say it enough. How fortunate. Um, how fortunate I was to have, you know, Jeremy especially, and Taryn, I mean, they're just always on. And Jeremy's a, you know, a red light player, you know, he's, he's meant for the prime time and, and, uh, and he's just always on. And so that made my job so much, just so much, e not easier in the sense that uh, I had nothing to do, but easy. it's one less thing to worry about when you're worrying about a million things. Um, and also then he can, he's one of those guys, he's one of those players that raises the level of everyone else's performance um which is which is you know which is a blessing for yeah. for a filmmaker you know so since this interview will be shared with our entire student body on march 3rd's career day 
What advice to students, what advice do you have to students thinking about careers in the entertainment industry? I, I would say for, for me, I'm going to kind of just careers in general. I, I think you got to aim high and don't let, don't be distracted when someone tells you you can't. You're going to, you're going to hit a million speed bumps and roadblocks along the way and you, you have a choice to you turn around, do you go around it or do you go through it? And I think, um, I think it's important that you're a listener. I think it's important that you learn as much as you can with whatever career you choose. And then keep driving forward and, and you know, keep that end goal in mind. With regard to acting, what, what do you think? So um, I think the arts in general are important, especially now um, when people have been glued to their houses for so long. People are watching TV or watching movies as a, as a way to escape to sink into these characters that Paolo's writing about, that his ideas come from, that I'm trying to bring to life, you know, as an actor. So I, I think the arts are extremely important. So to piggyback what Greg said, people are always going to tell you you can't. It, it, it'll, it'll always happen. doesn't matter what you do. Somebody will say you can't do it, right? And it's up to you to determine, you know, what your worth is, how successful you want to be, because the success should come from inside you, shouldn't come from the project you just worked on or what other people are telling you about and how you're successful that way. I mean, I've been plugging at this for a long time. Like, I've been, and, and I keep telling my daughters, I have two daughters, one in college, one in high school, and I keep telling them, if you've got a dream, <laughs> just keep plugging away at it, right? I mean, I do other things. I'm fortunate to have an acting studio, so I'm still in the world. You know, and I, I just dove into his, uh, his world uh, as a real estate agent. Um, so for me, to be able to continue to do the acting piece, you know, whether I'm playing an Irish bartender or, you know, whether I'm producing a movie, I'm still in the world. And at some point, you know, something bigger will happen, and it, but I'm never going to stop. So I think it's important to just keep driving forward to piggyback on Greg says. People are telling you no all day long, especially in this business. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are, and it may have changed from a directing standpoint, but you may go on 100 auditions before you get your first yes. That's what it was when I was coming up. And I spent eight years as a professional actor just acting in and out of New York. Now, my ratio is a little better than that, but like, if you think about that, 100 no's before you get told yes, you get used to hearing no. You get used to people saying you can't do it, so it becomes easier that way. So I think that... That helped me probably yeah. to get me, you know, resilient to, you won't be able to do that. Yeah, I would, I would agree. There's a resiliency that you need to have in the arts for sure. I mean, there's a saying, and, and I'm a believer in this, that every no is one step closer to a yes. And uh, that goes for acting, that goes for trying to line up financing, trying to line up actors for a project. I mean, there's, you're always getting no. Um, so that that just doesn't bother me. But, but I think for... Um, as it relates to the arts, I agree with you. I think, I mean, I think the arts are essential. They're essential, especially in, in these days. I saw it <clears throat> during 9-11. I was doing, I did concerts and, and similar to, to what Pete's saying, I was always in the arts. So I did concerts and, and theater and things like that in between films because they're hard to make films, feature films especially. Um, and we had two shows uh, Thursday and Friday or Wednesday and Thursday after 9-11 was on a Tuesday. And I watch people in a little small theater in, in Center City, and I watch people ball and, and, and just cry and, and thank us for how bad they needed to just escape what was going on. And that was the moment. And at the time, I was, tw you know, I don't know, in my early 20s, I guess. And uh, it was, you know, it really, that really stuck with me. It was like, wow, this is, it isn't just what I do. This, this stuff is important for everyone, you know. Um, they don't, uh, not everyone gets to do it. So it is a privilege to be able to do it. But uh yeah, like, like these guys said, just stick with it. And, 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 and now, I mean, much, so much different than when, when I was first starting out. Like, uh, your phones are better than the quality of my first feature film, you know? Uh, my first feature film wasn't HD. I mean, that's just true, you know? And, and uh, so it's, I, you know, in a way, there's no excuse. You just do it, you know? But you got to love it. You really do have to love it, you know, because you're going to get beat you know, down. To give a little credit to this guy, he's never done 100%. a movie before. 100%. He wrote a bunch of ideas down that he has as a kid growing up with these people. And he's like, I think we're going to make a movie. Yeah. So he just made a movie. He just did it. Like, he did it. And yeah, that's a hard process. It's also process. about the people that you come across course, along the way. Of course. Meeting Paolo and then him introducing us to the producers that were able to find the locations that we talked about, that were able to assemble the cast. Um, so it really, 
you know, you have an idea and you have to be willing to work with others and... Especially in film. I mean, film is the ultimate team sport. It's, it's the ultimate collaboration yep. across the board. Um, and it's not cheap, you know. I joke, I used to joke all the time, it's, 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 uh, it's like the ice hockey of, of, of the arts, you know. Like, uh, the reason why soccer is so popular in the, in the world is because you could roll up two socks and kick it around and, 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 and it's a sport. Whereas ice hockey requires equipment and, ice. you know, ice and it's just an expensive thing. And filmmaking, while it's gotten cheaper because you got, anyone can shoot on their phone, it's still an expensive endeavor relative to say a singer songwriter or, or something like that. So, you know, um, but yeah, to peace point and to, to credit Greg as well, especially the first time out, uh, is someone who is firmly established in other ventures successfully to have the, um, uh, you know, to have both the faith in me and, and in the team that was assembled and also the uh, kind of the wisdom to see, you know, okay, like it's not, it's just not a linear path, you know, and, and I don't know how much of that translates, honestly, to other to other industries, but filmmaking is its own beast for sure. And so, you know, I give Greg a lot of credit for that, for because it's not an easy it's not an easy road, and this has been a long, as they all are, a long uh, you know a long journey. So, grateful to be here with you guys, doing this interview. Seriously, we are. Um. So did did each of you always want to work in entertainment? I mean, this is kind of going off what we've already. Um, established, but if not, um, what were your aspirations um, when you were in high school? Uh, I I grew up here uh, in this area, obviously a graduate of O'Hara, but when I was growing up, it was more about sports and CYO. Mm -hmm. I always loved telling jokes. I always loved trying to make people laugh. I was the youngest. I have two older siblings, and um, so for me, I was always trying to vie for attention to begin with. So I lend, you know, uh, I, I handled that by trying to be funny. And it wasn't until my senior year here that I did, I did 42nd Street. That was my very first show. And it was on a dare from the basketball team. And um, I said, if I get cast in this, then you guys are coming with me as part of the ensemble. And so I went on stage, I did a song, I did a dance, they're like, congratulations. And I, I, so I call a couple of my buddies up in the basketball team, I get five of them to come, and they all, we all did it. As a, it was, I just joke, I loved it, I'm sure they loved it too, but they won't admit it. And so it wasn't until after high school, when I finally got into college, where I was like, you know what, I, I kind of like this. I think that I, I want to pursue this because I like the way I feel when I'm doing it. And so, you know, I would, I would sing, I would do variety shows, and then I got involved in community theater. So um, that was kind of how I took off. Um, I did Jesus Christ Superstar at the Narberth Theater, and a guy named Stephen Friedman, who uh, has passed away now, um, he's passed on, but he worked for NBC, and he handed me his business card, and he said, I think you should think about doing this uh, for real, professionally. And so uh, that was kind of the inspiration that I had. All right, let me give it a shot. I went up to New York. Uh, I sang for a bunch of agents in New York, and they all told me the same thing. You cannot sing, which, because I wanted to be on Broadway. I loved the way I felt when I was on stage. And they said, you can't sing, and it crushed me. So I left New York, and I remember just saying, maybe this isn't right for me. Maybe this isn't right. First time I heard no. First time I heard, you're no good at this. Um, and I just continued to get, you know, continue with uh, community theater, continue with, and then I'm like, well, wait a minute, there's, there's like another professional theater right here. So I auditioned for the media theater, sang a song, got a part in Jekyll and Hyde. I was one of the leads in Jekyll and Hyde. I'm like, well, how come I can sing here and I can't sing up in New York? So I'm like, all right, well, maybe that's, so I started to just process all that and then got involved with commercial world, which then led me to wanting to be in t in, you know, on TV and then in movies and here I am 20 minutes, uh, 20 years later, 20 minutes later, it feels like 20 years later. Um, I've, I've had some moderate success. It's nice. It's really nice. And I think it's important that I still live here. You know, I could have easily moved to Los Angeles, easily, or New York. But I chose to have a family here. I live here. I have a business here. You know, I meet these guys from here. You know, that's, that's an important message that I keep wanting to share. Like everybody's, it can be here. It can be here. Well, especially in film, yeah. because it's so transient. You know, you kind of, from a financials perspective, you go where the tax credits are, are most yeah. lucrative. And, and uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago was Louisiana. Before that, it was Toronto. And, and so 
you know, I mean, yeah, there's are more opportunities, of course, for an actor, especially, but in, in Los Angeles and New York, yes, but, but there is enough, there is, you know, if you, you can carve it out locally for sure. So I guess to round out your, the answer to the question you asked is I've always, I always believe I wanted to do this. I've always believed this is the, where I should be in this entertainment world. Somewhere in this pocket is where I, I wanted to be. Uh, from a very young age, I'm sure, and being able to do a little bit at a time, stay in it, even though I have to do other things to, you know, support the family, and, and but staying in this, I think I've always wanted to do it, and I'm extremely blessed to do it, extremely. Yeah, and I would say for me, I, I absolutely stumbled on it. In high school, this was not an aspiration for me. Um, I graduated from Upper Darby. Upper Darby had a great, uh, they have a great summer stage program and great arts program, and I was busy with sports through most of my childhood. So I, I kind of wanted to parlay sports and academics into the best college I could possibly get into, try to get a good job, but I didn't really have, uh, the arts weren't calling me at that time. It wasn't really until we started writing the script and it wasn't really even f until further along when actors started saying, I really like this. Um, I met each of the actors on set when they came on, and I remember saying to Bruce Stern, "Hey, you know, it's it's, it's an honor to have you here. Why'd you why'd you why'd you decide to do this?" And he said, "I just, I just love the script." He went to the University of Penn. He knew. He said, "I used to golf at Cobb's Creek. I knew Upper Darby pretty well, and I kind of know this character and I know this world." And it was that was kind of the eye opener t to me of like, there's a lot of stories that you have inside you to share with others that are unique and compelling, I think. Yeah, and you never know what someone's, what someone's, what somebody is going to gravitate towards. As an audience member, as an actor, you just never know. To piggyback on Greg's Bruce Stern story, um, I was awaiting a call from Bruce Stern, and he was interested, but he wasn't attached yet. He wanted to speak to the director. So it's Sunday night, and my wife and I are, are watching the, uh, the Eagles get blown out. Uh, or whatever, it's Sunday Night Football, and my phone rings, and it's Bruce Stern. I'm like, uh, you know, I got to take this call. Two and a half hours later, I get off the call, and it was like a master class. So I was literally taking notes on the phone. But the first thing he says is, Apollo, I gotta, uh, we got to talk about the ending of this, of this film. And there's a scene at the end that Bruce Stern is involved in. And, uh, and my, my, you know, I don't usually get nervous, but I was like, oh no, like, oh man, this is it, you know? And he's like, I love it, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh my goodness, so, you know, like, whew. and uh, And he went on and on and on, and, and, and it was just interesting to hear what, and he's now he's, he's bringing up, you know, he's worked with Hitchcock, he's worked with Kazan, you know, he's worked with all these, Tarantino most recently, and he's like, this reminds me, of, and he's just going on and on and on, and I'm like, wow, like, all right. And he, and he genuinely loved it, and, and uh, you just never know, right? And, and so, um, but anyway, yeah, it's a funny little Dern story. But, uh, but I knew we were in a good spot then. So it was like, all right, well now, you know, this isn't, I mean, you know, some films are for paydays for actors. This wasn't, this wasn't a, that film for any of them. And so that's a really nice feeling, you know, where you know where they genuinely have an interest in some element of it. And that's really all you need, need is a, an element. I don't need them to love it all. I need them to love a piece. And then we can, I can go with it, you know, so. If you could go back and give advice to your high school self, what would you say? Well, this is easy for me. It is that your friends are morons and that they will inevitably bring you down when there's a problem. And, and, but to, chair it, to take the good from the relationships that you've found and the good's gonna, bad's gonna come with the good, but, but just focus on the good and, and the people side of things, I think, for me. Yeah. Um, I think, for me, uh, it took me a long time to realize that the, the more you give, the more you get. And it's something that was kind of taught, so I went to 12 years of Catholic school, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But I think someone who is very selfish with their time in general, always want more time to write, to create, to do this, um, and you have children, and, and, and you know, it was the first time it really hit me, and it, as an adult, I was like, oh, well, this isn't really just about me. My wife would say all the time, you know, the more you give, the more you receive, but, but I wish I, I wish I, at your age, I wish I kind of fully understood that a little bit younger than it, as long as it took me to kind of really understand that uh, you don't get until you, until you give, you know? And the reward of giving is just as, as strong as receiving in a lot of ways. That right there, so, that's a great message. You know, 
I'd like to take that. I like that answer. Um, yeah, you, once you get out of the, uh, what am I getting in return? If you get out of that and you just give for the sake of giving, then you're, you're getting stuff you never even thought about. It's just coming to you because that's, that's the way it works. And it, it does take a while to, to, to figure that out. I would tell my younger self, the thing that you are afraid of is the thing that you got to go at. That's what I would tell my younger self. Because I think a lot of us are hindered by fear. We're stunted by fear. Um, and like high school stinks, let's face it. Like trying to navigate high school, the way the world is right now, I'm sorry, I, like, that's harsh, but the truth is it's difficult. Social media, it didn't have, we didn't have any of that. Like it's very difficult. And I have two daughters, so I know how hard it can be. So, you know, it's constantly in your face. I would say go at the thing that you're afraid of. Just go at it because you'll find out, oh, I'm more capable than I thought I was. I shouldn't have been afraid of that in the, in the first place. You know, I, all right, let me do some other things that scare me. Yeah, I think it's important to remember as a high school student that the high school doesn't define you. You know, you, you have your whole life to kind of redefine yourself and be the person that you want to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think about that now, like how everything is so, what happened on Friday is the biggest deal in the world. And like, it just, none of it really matters as you get, you know, it just, it becomes a different, you know, a different thing. It's the biggest deal in the world to you guys in the moment, you know, which is funny because in, in film, it's always off of being in the moment, but really as you, and it's important to be there when you're day to day, but uh, yeah, nothing is, it's, everything's magnified in high school. It's really not that big of a deal. Anyway. It doesn't define you. That's really nice. I, it's true. It's so true. So true. Um, yeah. And the friendships you forge are important as well. Yeah. We are so grateful to Greg Lingo, Paolo Pilati, and Pete Pustiglione for joining us today to talk about their film, Last Call. Last Call will be released by IFC Films on March 19th. The comedy will be available through On Demand, iTunes, Amazon, and Pay-Per-View, as well as select theaters in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago.